Hello again, everybody, and welcome back to Ring Respect Radio right here on the Video Bros Network. I am Bobby Munson, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, my tag team bro. He is the video bro himself, the man with the angelic voice and the throat of the goat, Mr. Papa Smokes. How you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Munson. I'd like to give a shout-out to all the wrestling people out there. Hopefully everybody is still out there having a lot of fun, staying safe, enjoying some good old wrestling on the TV. And you know what? Just enjoying everything in general. Pop Smokes, a lot of good wrestling out there. What have you been watching these days, aside from the obvious? I've been watching a lot of stuff, Munson, uh, between the uh, global pandemic and the uh, sub-minus-50 temperatures over the past couple of weeks. I've had uh, a lot of time to watch a lot of stuff, but... Uh, I always keep up with the uh, Major League Wrestling episodes, and uh, we got a couple to review here today. We sure do, yeah. We're going to be going over MLW Fusions 117 and 118. As always, uh, we like to try to do our best to keep up to the times with MLW, but you know what? Just like always, uh, you know, some of you out there have not yet seen these episodes, and you can go back and recap them, just like Papa Smokes and I do as well, too. You don't always have to watch them live, but... You can catch up on all the action on the MLW website uh, up on YouTube there. I believe they're also on a few different uh, few different other streaming networks and stuff like that, including, uh, Jesus, I try to think of the names off my head, uh, FUBU Sports or something like that, I believe, picked up MLW, if I'm not mistaken there. Yeah. And uh, also the DAZN app as well, too, which I, uh, I actually have the DAZN app myself. I use that for watching all my... Uh, soccer matches and everything like that and i noticed that mlw is up on there and promoted quite heavily on there too so good for them i mean great news for major league wrestling very much so uh quarter power has always got his fingers in a few different pies and uh, he's trying to get his product onto as many eyeballs as possible and uh, getting on the, the zone app will be a huge part in that yeah and i believe uh it uh, they've got a few more things in the works as well, too. I noticed that uh, Court Bauer has been saying there's been a lot of talks and a lot of things happening and that it's a really good time for MLW. So if you haven't done so already, go over and check them out and also support them. Give them a subscribe on YouTube like I'm going to ask you to do for us right here, right now. If you haven't done so already, click subscribe down below and hit the notification bell so you can know anytime we release new material here on the Video Bros Network. You can also go check us out on Podbean and over on YouTube through our friends at Backbreaker Media. Backbreaker Media covering all sorts of sports, including professional wrestling in Saskatchewan, Alberta, the Prairies area. So our good friends over in Alberta, big shout out to you guys as well, too. Wonderful work that you guys do out there. And you know what? Just for the hell of it, I'm going to give a quick shout out to another guy that maybe deserves it well, too. I'll, I'm going to give a quick shout out to our good friend Spencer Love. He's been running his new show I uh, love wrestling over there in Alberta, and he seems to be picking up a lot of steam, and uh, congratulations to him on that one. Yeah, busy all the time, uh, Spencer. Hey, he's, he's the interview master, and uh, his, his channel's really picking up in popularity. Great for him. Uh, shout out to uh, Spencer Love. Yeah, well, I know he's always asking for those interviews and getting a lot of them, so hey, why not uh, right here, right now, if... Uh, if you're ever up for it, Spencer Love, Pop Smokes and I would love to sit down and have you on Ring Respect Radio one time in the near future. So hopefully we can arrange to have that kind of thing happen. Great idea. Let's make it happen. Definitely so. But as we were saying before, Pop Smokes, a lot of wrestling to watch, and especially with these very cold temperatures here in Saskatchewan, there's nothing to do but sit around and watch some good old wrestling. And we are now playing catch-up on MLW Fusion. MLW Fusion 117 and 118 is what we're reviewing on the show here today. And we're going to start off with MLW Fusion episode 117. Bubba Smokes, we briefly started talking about this when we did our Kings of Coliseum recap, which you can now find on the channel here on YouTube as well, too. We were talking about Selena De La Renta and her producing this episode of MLW Fusion. Yeah, isn't that just an excellent feat from such a young uh, woman? She has uh, executive produced a few episodes in the past as well, in a, the past couple of years before uh, COVID lockdown and such, to quite success here. And, and this is her latest episode. She gets it all to herself. She uh, executive produces the entire show and uh, does a great job of it for a, for a 23 or 24-year-old person in the business. This is just... Big stuff, and, and she does a great job. 
she, she obviously has some great teachers around her and everything, teaching her the right way of doing things and handling it. But, I mean, like you say, for somebody 23, 24 in there, uh, she does a great job of not only production, but being an on-screen personality as well, too. She's very memorable, really good at her promos and stuff like that. And I see a very bright future for Selena De La Renta. Yeah, I could, couldn't agree more. She's uh, She reminds me of uh, Cherry Martel as a manager kind of thing, uh, uh, as a very outgoing personality, a uh, very uh, snooty type, uh, bitch type persona, and uh, and isn't afraid to get involved physically in, in matches as well, and uh, uh, cuts a great promo and, and, and looks great. Uh, I just think she's a, a, a huge uh, asset for the MLW Fusion shows, uh, not only in her backstage uh, capabilities, but uh, on screen as well. Definitely so. And so with that said, let's uh, start talking about this episode of fusion that she was behind so we started things off uh, i believe right into action with uh the runner-up to the 2020 opera cup low key taking on bud heavy yeah uh, don't some of these preliminary talents have some great names in mlw oh uh, absolutely awesome. yeah it was a perfect fitting but let's uh i mean we can make this short and sweet just like the match was low key eight seconds knockout but heavy down for the three count, man. This this kicked off fast and ended fast, Papa Smokes. Yeah, yeah, and I think this match makes sense because, um, as we've seen MLW since since the restart, uh, Low Key is one of their top talents, but he's been uh, he's taken a couple of losses, uh, not only in the Opera Cup, but uh, uh, otherwise than that too. So I think this is. Uh, once the Opera Cup finished, this is uh, kind of a restart for Low Key. In his career, I don't think he was prepared to screw around in this match whatsoever. He ran in, uh, nailed the running arm strike on uh, Bud Heavy there, and uh, that was the end of that match. So uh, Low Key, again, uh, after a couple of losses, coming out in this match looking extremely strong, and then calling out Team Filthy afterwards. Well, yeah, and that's uh, seemingly where everything's leading without... Me jumping the gun and going into episodes that we aren't covering here today. There is a lot being involved here with him going towards Team Filthy and what's going to be happening in the upcoming week here on MLW Fusion as well too. Especially involving that quick knockout that plays a big factor on an upcoming match that we're going to see Loki involved with this coming Wednesday. Okay, well good. Don't don't skip too far ahead. Not going to finish uh, 117 here. <laughs> That's right, not going to skip too far ahead. We'll leave it at that. Leave everybody uh, guessing a little bit or checking out the social medias afterwards. So, All right, but jumping on from there, Papa Smokes, we uh, went right into a Leo Rush promo. So the new middleweight champion, Leo Rush, getting a chance to get on screen, talk about his win, talk about himself. Uh, had some facts up on the screen, some Leo facts on there. Uh, what do you think of this promo? I, I actually liked it. I I've never considered myself a fan of Leo Rush, uh, but in the way that he's come into MLW as kind of a, a top heel in the company, but at that at that middleweight level, he's, he seems to be uh, just fighting people in that uh, weight category at this time. He's really impressed me a lot. That that title match against Myron Rush, where or Myron Reed, pardon me, where Rush won the title was as we reviewed it in the previous episode of Ring Respect, was just an absolutely great match. And then I'm liking his promos, too. He heals it up big. He's got that smarmy little grin on his face that makes you want to choke him a bit. And uh, he's getting over big time. He's actually a pretty good talent, and I'm looking forward to seeing more from uh, Leo Rush. Yeah, there was a few things that I heard about from his younger, like when he first started out, that... Uh kind of put me off of being a fan, but the way that MLW is utilizing him and the way he's carrying himself in MLW works, it works very well. Uh, this promo was great. And again, without jumping ahead of myself, there is a lot more to come from this kid, and I look forward to it, actually, a lot of it. I think this could be a year where my whole opinion on being a Leo Rush fan changes. Uh, they continue down this road, Papa Smokes. I think this conversation next year will be about how we become fans of Leo Rush. Yeah, it might not might not even take that long. He, he's doing a good job in, in his role in MLW. Definitely so. So I mean, good on him. Can't wait to see what's uh, coming up next for Leo Rush. So, 
from there, uh, we had a big debut happening on MLW. Uh, this was the debut. Uh, Selena De Laurent has been promising for a long time. Mil Mortes. Mertes. Yeah. That I believe that I, I've almost got that down right, just about. Yeah, I I don't speak Mexican myself, but I believe it's Muertes, like M, and then you say where. Muertes. Yes. Mem Muertes. Yeah, yeah, that's better. But there we go. All right, I'm learning. I'm learning. Each day, but uh, yeah, so I mean, we got the, his debut against uh, Brian Pillman Jr., and again, Brian Pillman Jr., he's someone that's, you know, I mean, he's he's used in that fashion to kind of be the, the guy for guys to go over kind of thing, like he's he's a big enough of a name that it's it's enough to get the more than just that uh, going over a, uh, a an enhanced talent guy or, you know, a jobber, as they would call him. I mean, he's he, just he, by the heavy. Well, exactly. He's, he's he's more than a bud heavy, I mean, at least, kind of thing. So when you get a match of this caliber with a name like Brian Pillman Jr., you can at least expect that the win is going to be more impactful if it happens. And, of course, yes, it did happen. Brian Pillman Jr. Uh, loses after a few minutes to Mill. Oh, hold on here. Mill War? Fuck it. You know what? We'll get it one day. Anyway. <laughs> anyway, I... Yeah, big big victory here. And uh, what did you think? Uh, impressive looking victory. Yeah, I think so. Um, first of all, I, I really liked uh, Muertes, the look of him as he came out the, with the uh, traditional Aztec kind of outfit. That looked real cool. Um, the guy's physically huge. Like, what a brute of a man. He's uh, pretty tall, but look at how thick that body is, and he's thickly muscled. You can see he's not a super young guy, but, uh, wow, he looks very intimidating. And uh, you could see that Brian Pillman Jr. felt that, too. He had the, he had the look of uh, fear and uncertainty on his face, and I can kind of see that, too, because uh, even in bringing in Mil Muertes, uh, Selena de la Renta has been performing all kinds of occult rituals and she's got her sacrificial knife and, and her flames and her candles and everything. So this the entire uh, uh, kind of feeling around Mil Muertes is, is one of, of kind of supernatural occult and such. Maybe that got to Pillman a little bit. Maybe it was just the, seeing a guy that size across the ring with the scary mask on and everything. But uh, yeah, Pillman, uh, looked afraid in this match, uh, didn't want to really lock up with Muertes at first. Uh, uh, yeah, I have it here in my notes, Munson. Uh, Pillman looked flatter than a plate of piss in this match. And, uh, <laughs> that, that's, that's really no exaggeration. So uh, Muertes with the big win with the uh, straight to hell uh, face buster type move. And uh, yeah, a nice, impressive, uh, dominant uh, gala victory for Mil Muertes. And you know what? Uh, in such a short period of time, MLW, since this restart, I mean, they had to start making some new names there. They had to bring some names in. But in a short period of time, they not only have done a great job of bringing in some talent, but they've also done a great job in enhancing some of the talent that they already had there as it is, too. And they look really strong in the fact that they have got some top-notch people to carry this company on. They got people that are going to sit there at the top of the card. People are going to sit in the upper card that can give the top guys a run for their money. And they've got, you know, the middleweights and everybody else along the lines, a tag division that's hot right now, too. I mean, the pieces are all coming together in favor of everybody over in MLW. Yeah, I think so, too. And uh, they're going through a bit of a switch right now. I mean, they've, they lost some talents to the new company, AEW. And uh, a couple of other things, but uh, yeah, like like we've talked about in the past, uh, Court Bauer is always uh, trying to work with and trade talent with uh, other promotions such as AAA Lucha Libre in Mexico City, and uh, that way we get um, a fresh new train of talent coming in and out all the time, and. Uh, uh, I, I don't mind if it's uh, wrestlers making shots sometimes, maybe a one or two or three matches, and then they're gone. It, it's still fun to see new talent that you've never seen before. Uh, get to see them maybe making their television debut or 
get to see them uh, trying out their skills against some of the established stars that we already know from MLW. It just keeps things fresh, and I, I like it that way. Oh, I couldn't agree with you more, Papa Smokes. It's a breath of fresh air. It's given us all sorts of matches that you don't see week to week on some of the uh, bigger shows and stuff like that uh, so that you don't get bored of the content. There's always new things, always uh, new faces to try. And while maybe not everything clicks every single time 100%, in the end, we get a really well put together show that enhances the talent properly. Yeah, yeah, and uh, and that's that's the whole idea behind trying something different, trying some different combinations, and seeing if uh, various uh, matchups or, or pairs of wrestlers have chemistry together. You never know what you might find, but you have to try some different stuff and some new stuff uh, every so often just to see if it works and. I appreciate companies that do that, even if it doesn't work every single time. That's to be expected. They're trying some new stuff, and some of it will stick. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly what's happened here. Neil Martez uh, instantly shoots right to the top of the, the card, in a sense. I mean, yeah, it's only one win against uh, Brian Pillman Jr., but this guy is a legend. He comes with quite a storied history and stuff like that. I mean, they built him up as this absolute monster at the same time. So you got to imagine this guy is a top top card guy. This is a guy who's going to be mixing it up with the likes of Hammerstone and, you know, inevitably Jacob Fatu, Tom Lawler, any of the guys who are currently sitting at the top of the MLW card. And yeah, don't forget, uh, it's a little bit of an ace in the hole to have uh, Selena De La Renta as your representative or manager as well. She'll uh, she'll get you many advantages in the company and in the ring as well. She sure will, and uh, we're probably going to see a little bit more of that coming up uh, as we get towards the end of this review. But uh, from here, we actually had, uh, this was a video package uh, kind of recapping a little bit of the story of the uh, Caribbean Championship currently held by Richard Holiday, or could we say arguably held by Richard Holiday? Because here we find out Savio yeah. Vega saying that the belt was actually stolen from him. Savio Vega should be the rightful champion. And Richard Holiday robbed him of this championship, according to this video package. Yeah, yeah. And we this is an angle they've kind of been teasing for a little while about uh, Holiday and his his Caribbean championship. We don't know the circumstances under which we won it, but if you know Richard Holiday, you must suspect that there's some uh, foul business afoot. So, uh, yeah, yeah, we're going to hear the truth from uh, Savio Vega, and obviously they're leading up to uh, something in the future, possibly between these two, possibly involving that uh, championship. Uh, I, I'm not sure if uh, that's one of MLW's deals is with uh, Caribbean or Puerto Rican wrestling, if they can actually have a championship match for that belt on TV, but I suppose we'll find out. Certainly so. Uh, from there, we had uh, another promo, this one from uh, Filthy Tom Lawler himself. Uh, this one, him talking about his refereeing job tonight. He is going to be the special guest referee in the Tag Team Championship match between the Von Ericks and Los Parks. Tom Lawler ensuring the audience that he's going to call it down the middle. Your thoughts on that, Papa Smokes? Yeah, yeah, I'm skeptical. Anytime there's a special referee, you have to wonder what, what they have in mind and... Uh, a guy like Tom Lawler, you can bet that he's probably up to no good, and uh, we'll just see. Uh, uh, we'll have to see what kind of a referee he makes. Yeah, certainly. So uh, from there, the promos continued on. Uh, Injustice had a nice little promo there. Uh, it was uh, Myron Reed getting a lot of the uh, the words in on this one, and uh, again, Myron Reed continuing to cut some really decent promos. Really like where he's going with things, and continue on this. Uh, feud that they've got going between Injustice and Contra. Yeah, yeah, this is uh, this is one I didn't really see coming until the last few weeks when they started mentioning it, is that uh, Injustice had had uh, used to have three members, as you remember. Cotto Brazil was the other guy, but um, since the restart and since, uh, you know, it had been shut down for COVID, uh, Cotto Brazil doesn't seem to be around, and uh, they're saying that uh, Contra had injured him and he's unable to perform in MLW anymore. I don't know if that's the real story or not, but um, he's no longer there. So now as a as a two-man faction, uh, they've got their sights set on, on Contra. And, uh, this strikes me as uh, 
perhaps not such a good idea from Injustice. I like them, but they seem more suited to the sort of middle card area. They're both pretty young. They're, neither of them is very big, and I just, I, quite frankly, I worry about them uh, getting anything done against Contra, especially uh, the, uh, the huge guys like uh, Jacob Fatu and, and uh, Mads Kruger. I mean, I've heard uh, Jordan Oliver and Myron Reed uh, you know, talk some smack about Contra, about maybe taking it to Contra, and maybe uh, even getting into the ring with Fatu and such. And yeah, I don't, not sure that those guys can chew up what they're trying to bite off right now. And uh, but we'll see what happens. Uh, there's a few interesting matchups that could happen. We still have to see uh, Simon Gotch versus uh, Jordan Oliver, which was canceled from an earlier show. And uh, yeah, I'm interested to see where this feud goes. Uh, it, but I must admit, it, it does seem like uh, Injustice might be fairly overmatched in this. Yeah, and you know, going back to your point with uh, Cotto Brazil, I don't know the any story or anything. I've never looked up uh, anything about why he's not there currently. But what if uh, they were playing on this storyline and all of a sudden this feud between Contra and Injustice goes down and who ends up being behind the mask to one of the Sentai Death Squad? No other than Cota Brazil. Yeah, yeah, that'd be wild. I mean, it's it, it's a long shot, but who knows? Maybe that there's something in the works there. We we'll guess we'll have to see as this one unfolds more. Well, that would help even even out the odds for sure. For sure, it would. But uh, from there, we go to our main event of the evening. This was the one uh, tag team championship match. The champions, the Vaughn Ericks, they're going to be going in. A, I believe this was scheduled a no DQ matchup against Lo, uh, Los Parks. This is L.A. Park and. Sorry again with my pronunciation. Hijo de la Park? Uh, yeah, Hijo de, de L.A. Park. Yeah, uh, the oh. son of L.A. Park. Okay, so I, I was close. I'm getting there. I'm try, trying to learn as much as I yeah. can, but not really yeah. great with names. But, yes, they're going to be escorted down to the ring by Selena De La Renta, the producer of tonight's show. She got them this matchup. She made it a no DQ, and she put the Tom Lawler, filthy Tom Lawler, as the guest referee. I mean, we said it on our last review. This, this one stinks. There is something in the works here that just doesn't sit right. The Vaughn Ericks were walking into a trap, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. And you knew that when Selena De La Renta had control of an entire show that she was going to give her main man, L.A. Park, and, and uh, his tag team partner a, a title shot. They, they've been trying to get those tag team title shots since, again, since before uh, COVID, like since before this year even. So, uh you knew that when she got the chance, she was going to give her man, uh, La Parca, and his son a, a shot at the titles. Now she's got the special referee in there, Tom Lawler, and we all know the, the terrible problems he had with the Von Erichs last year and a feud and uh, all kinds of uh, jumpings and, uh, and head stompings and such going on in that feud. So, uh, yeah, like you say, this this stinks to high heaven and, uh, and the, the Von Erichs are, are in tough in this match. Yeah, they definitely were. And again, I mean, they put up a, a great fight. I mean, a lot of a lot of great, uh, I guess, comebacks from the Von Erichs and stuff like that, showing their strength, their determination, their heart and everything. But again, I mean, you had to, anyone had to know going into this that there was pretty much no way out other than a, lo a loss here for the Von Erichs. And that's exactly what ended up happening uh, between Tom Lawler and all the interference and everything like that, it was not called down the middle, and we ended up with new tag team champions as a result. Yeah, we sure did. And, and You know, it's kind of funny. I, while I was watching this match and all the shenanigans that were going on and the rule-breaking and the, the crooked wrath and everything, it was it was making me think about the story of uh, Rasputin. Do you ever know anything about that, Munson? the uh, he had gotten in uh, bad against some of the Russian aristocracy, so they decided to have him killed. And they kind of thought that he was a bit of a god-type character, so they they stabbed him, they shot him, they hung him, they threw him in the river, they poisoned him, and, and still he, he just barely died after all that. This is basically what happened in this match. I mean, there was interference, there was... There was uh, the referee Lawler was being completely crooked. There was uh, foreign objects. There was there was uh, Selena's interference spraying the mace into the eyes of Ross Von Eric. And uh, I mean, they just they did everything. But, but 
hit them over the head with the kitchen sink kind of thing. And, and just no matter what the Von Erics did, they were screwed in this match. So they're not going to be happy about that. It's bad enough to lose uh, tag team championships at the best of times, but they were cheated uh, five or six different times out of those belts in that one match. So, uh, we got ourselves a nice feud coming up, but uh, the big mask Mexicans aren't going to go down easy. Uh, they look pretty tough, don't they, Munson? And uh, just big dudes and big roughhouse style, as well as some uh, high flying lucha. Well, yeah, and it's it, they're they're a great team as well. And the one reason I'm going to kind of point something out here and why I think that this whole thing worked in the end, like you could, I, I hear a lot of people complain when they see matches end in, you know fashions like this or a match end with the DQ or a count out or anything like that. And, you know, it's for that reason that this kind of shit actually does work and people don't take a, the proper time to really think about how much it works. Um, the Von Erics were screwed. You knew they were going to be screwed from the second they walked into this thing and stuff. But again, this was probably the best way to get the belts off of these boys without making it look like they were, you know, legitimately beat in that ring. So it gives them a lot more credibility, shows that they've got toughness, they've got that heart and determination, and it really kind of pumps them up and really kind of gives them that that baby face hero feel. Like you want to cheer for these guys. They gotta get revenge on the the big bad villains that have gone and cheated them out of all this. And this is why booking like that can work. As long as it makes sense and doesn't fall into this goofy territory where it's just being done because somebody's a fan of watching uh, no DQ matches or guest referee matches when it makes sense for it to be done and it's pulled off properly when it's done like this, it can work. Yeah. I think you make a good point there, Munson. And uh, not to mention at the same time as, as making the uh, Von Eriks look like believable uh, baby faces. And at the same time, it, it heals up uh, lost parks. It puts heat on Selena and it puts heat on Lawler as well. Like you, you, they got a lot of mileage out of that match for uh, selling their selling their evil heels to the fans. And uh, I think it's uh, I think it's a good match uh, in that way too. They built all kinds of heat for sure. So, and that uh, yeah, and that's generally what uh, we got out of MLW One Seventeen in a nutshell. A good show, well put together, and props to Selena De La Renta on a well put together produced show. Uh, great talent that she's got coming up. Uh, before we transition into the next episode, though, uh, I just want to, you know, comment on the commentary for a moment here. Like, well, uh, I thought we'd just have a little open discussion about uh, the commentary on MLW Fusion that we're getting each and every week. Uh, Rich Bocchini, uh, St. Laurent, both on there week by week. What are your opinions on them on commentary so far, Papa Smokes? Uh, I actually like them quite a bit. I had watched... Um Rich Bikini on on uh, MLW, you know, previous to when we were uh, reviewing it on this show, and I always thought he well, I guess he doesn't do commentary like in ring commentary on this. Is is it Bikini and Saint Laurent, or are they just the stick men on this? No, they're they're the commentators. They so they're okay. they're the that's ones right. doing commentary throughout. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. I'm just confused for a second there, but. Um, yeah, yeah, Bikini's good as the play-by-play guy. Uh, when Saint Laurent started, just uh, uh, you know, as as of the restart, as of the past couple months, I wasn't completely <clears throat> convinced about him at first. But I've I've come to like his his color style. Um, he kind of is a little bit of a heel color commentator, but. Kind of keeps it straight up too, and uh, uh, I, I like his style. He's got some uh, good things to say. He uh, he he makes the story sound better. He, he makes it sound more like a a sporting event as well too, and uh, calls it like a world of sports style wrestling, kind of a, as an actual fight, actual struggle between two humans. So um, I, I actually like it. What do you think of these two? Yeah, I'm liking it more and more each week, actually. Uh, like, Rich Bocchini obviously has got a great announcer's voice. He carries himself in a very great professional manner. And he doesn't bore you at the same time. That's the one thing I find about some wrestling uh, commentators, especially the the lead play-by-play guys, is that they can get a little bit dry and start to sound all the same that you can't differentiate. Yeah. But he's not like that. He's not flat and dry like these other guys. He makes sense. 
And you know what? St. Laurent is starting to really come around the more I watch him. And again, I don't want to jump the gun on things I've heard on certain episodes, but St. Laurent is really coming into his own, really kind of, you know, making a claim for who he is and kind of fleshing that out more and more each week so that we're getting that great banter that we want to hear between two guys while at the same time keeping it professional and talking about the match on hand. I think it's excellent personally. Um, St. Laurent also gives hope to Canadians because he's a fellow Canadian. Uh, seems that they uh, like Canadians over in MLW. Yeah, yeah, that's always nice to get some Canadian content there too. This uh, Saint Laurent is another guy I've, I've been meaning to kind of look up. I, I have the feeling he's been somebody in wrestling at some point, uh, uh, possibly a company owner or something like that. I'm not going to speculate. I'll, I'll look it up and we'll talk about it on a future uh, episode. But uh, he uh, he looked a little uncomfortable at first, but that's certainly under understandable coming into a new uh, company and all that but uh yeah he's he's picked up his game a lot uh, he sounds good he sounds convincing and i think the commentary team is is one of the uh draws for mlw and then uh yeah i, I agree with you and i've also got to say i give i'll give a quick shout out to their uh backstage commentator alicia too as well another fellow canadian i give her the props because i mean she's carrying that on her own and they're utilizing her in a way that she stands out as being that role where a lot of the other companies, they have interchangeable people that week by week or somebody else kind of thing. And you can't tell one week from another who's who. It's nice to see that they have someone they're going to stick with. And this is the who's going to do their backstage interviews and segments like that. So the, you as a fan get to know this is who's who's doing that, that role kind of thing instead of worrying each week who this new person is. That's a good point. And, um, you know, it's kind of a rule in, in pro wrestling that, uh, that you know, you don't, your announcers don't need to get over. They're, they're putting people over. But as the business has fleshed out and, and changed a little bit over the years, I, I don't think that's necessarily true. And also, um, we've all seen that announcers have been over in the past, despite their attempts not to be, such as Gene Okerlund and, uh, and some of the famous announcers from the past. Uh, I think it's nice that Alicia... Um, you know, has a, has a little bit of a character, a little bit of a following and all that. She's not trying to get herself over at the expense of the wrestlers or anything like that. But um, it's like you say, it's good to have that same familiar face. Uh, you know kind of what to expect when she's going to uh, uh, interview somebody. And uh, I enjoy seeing uh, the awkward sexual tension between her and Richard Holiday too, which seems to be... Uh, <laughs> Seems to be something just brewing on the on the back burner a little bit there, which is quite hilarious to me also. So, uh, yeah, yeah, all, all props to our fellow Canadian uh, Alicia and the rest of the announcers. Yeah, definitely so. So I just wanted to take that time to talk about them because a lot of the time these are the unsung heroes of professional wrestling, sometimes the people who don't get the mentions each and every week. And you know what? We respect what you guys do. So for all three of you, you know, mad props from myself and Papa Smokes and uh, – Continue up the great work we love hearing from you guys. So uh, next, uh, we're going to go right into our MLW 118 review. So recapping the show, this is MLW Fusion, episode 118. Papa Smokes, this one, big title match to the top off the night. We're going to get to that real soon. But before we do, we find out right off the hop that ACH was allegedly attacked, possibly by Team Filthy, ahead of his match with Jacob Fatu for the championship on this episode. Yeah, this was big news. You, you, ACH attacked by some group of thugs outside his gym earlier in the week. Had some uh, midsection injuries uh, occurred during uh, during that attack, uh, and well, was refusing to uh, postpone or cancel his match against Fatu. So we got a notification that that match was going to go on uh, on episode one eighteen. So we will have that match tonight. Yeah, and I mean, how great is it that MLW does some of these things where they have segments that don't exist or you don't have to see them? It's left up to the imagination or up to the commentary team to start to sell that to you. No, this is breaking news. This is what went down. We're going to try to find out more for you. And it really just, it creates more tension and excitement for that match at the end of the night too because the whole time you're wondering, can ACH pull through? What's going to happen? Like, is Jacob Fatu just going to shred this guy in a matter of minutes now? You know, it it really makes the night very interesting, to say the least, without ever having to actually show anything. 
Yeah, yeah, I think so too. And um, not like some companies do these days where there's a camera on every single occurrence that happens in the back and there's uh, constantly uh, dressing room beatdowns and uh, back alley uh, uh, sneak attacks and, and, uh, and various uh, shenanigans of those types. It's all on camera all the time. It just, it isn't believable. It, it sounds stupid. So, I mean, uh, uh, this just comes as a, as kind of like a news event. There's no, no footage of it or anything. We just find out about it through his injury and it just, it lends a believability to the whole thing. Oh yeah, for sure. And I mean, I, you, you got to realize that that's, you got to set things up a proper way and stuff like that. And it's not always about having a camera on everybody at all times, because like you said, it's completely unbelievable. Uh, it, it takes me back to when we were doing our PPW show, uh, you know, the, God, now it's over a year already, Pop Smokes, damn time flies. But uh, with, you know, doing some of the work that we had with Jacob Creed and Michael Allen, Richard Clark, and I'm not going to go give everything away, but there was a lot of discussion about how to present things and how to do things in a certain way that was believable and how we could pull this off, not only both for the fans on hand, but as well as for all the people watching on YouTube as well, too. It had to make sense for both. Yeah, and that's one of the things I really, really appreciate about PPW is that uh, we have a, a management and booking team which puts the stuff together in a logical manner, in a believable manner, too, so that it's it's not just making these decisions on the spur of the moment or uh, making matches because fans want them to happen and things like that. It's got to make logical sense in the grand scheme of things. And uh, I agree, uh, MLW has that sports-based presentation, so it's there's a little bit of wacky stuff that goes on in this show, obviously, but uh, uh, they, they make sure that it's uh, consistent and uh, and uh, completely believable to the viewer. Yeah, very much so. And it's, uh, it's, again, we've just opened up a great discussion to kick things off, and they haven't even got to the first match of the night. So, I mean, mad props yeah. to MLW for going that path. It's a, you know something that was done a lot back in the day, and I felt like it was a very strong way of doing things. You don't have to have cameras constantly following everybody you don't have to show every little thing sometimes that little bit of imagination is all the fan needs to create their own thought in their mind until you get to the point of revealing the truth behind it all yeah that's totally right i, I like the way they're doing this and uh, and uh you need some of these occurrences for uh, booking reasons to uh, make matches and to sell matches but uh it's, it's all about in the presentation of the way you do it. And I think MLW's got a straight ahead way of doing it that uh, engages the viewer. Definitely so. So now we're moving on to the first match of one, episode 118. This match, the debut of Davari in MLW taking on Zenshi. So Davari making his debut. And I mean, we mentioned this before, man, this guy looks like a star. This guy is shredded and he looks like he's ready to murder anybody in his path. Absolutely, and do you, are you familiar with Davari before? I mean, I, I never knew him as an independent wrestler, but I remember when he had that run in the WWE, uh, so I'm going to estimate somewhere around 20, 2008 or 2010 or something like that as the uh, manager for that Muhammad Hassan. Do you remember this little run, Munson, where they had uh, Muhammad Hassan was kind of a terrorist type character but he wasn't really a terrorist he just everyone thought he was and that's what he was angry about like that's kind of what his gimmick was it was they, they, he was given a big push at the time and i always thought davari as his uh, manager was the smaller guy but he was also good in the ring and he was one of those managers that you, you could see was a good wrestler too could take bumps and all that stuff so uh, I always wondered, and I had heard that after Hassan left the business, that Davari was still active as a wrestler. I think he might be a Detroit boy or something like that. Anyway, he was hitting the Indies hard and uh, working on his skills and everything. And then as we can see now, he's been working on his bodybuilding a whole hell of a lot too and just looking great. And this has got to be a big opportunity for uh, Davari to land in a, in a growing company like MLW and, and uh getting a good spot as a member of Contra too. Like that's got to make a big difference to a guy. And, uh, 
you can see by his debut match, he's going to make the most of that opportunity. Oh, yeah, man. And you know what? First of all, I do very, very well remember that uh, particular run with uh, Muhammad Hassan. I remember when they came in together and I thought right away, I mean, I knew where the WWE was going with the thought behind it all. And I thought, hey, you know what? It works. The timing's right for an angle like this. And it was a shame that for Muhammad Hassan, that came to such an early close due to uh, politics with some of the sponsors and stuff at the time, from what I understand from different uh, guys in the business who have talked about it on various podcasts and everything. But then Davari got a chance to get in the ring, and I thought there was a lot of potential with him, uh, that whole run that he had with the WWE. I thought that uh, there was a lot there, and I heard, same as you, I had heard about his work on the indies, but I had not actually seen it. And then when he came back, looking like absolute gold when he came back to MLW here, and I do know that uh, his, I think it's his brother, Aria Davari or something, had to go with the WWE in the Cruiserweight Classic. Again, it seems like that whole family is just, they're, they're really good ring workers. They're good on a microphone. And I think they know how to work a crowd. They know how to play heels extremely well. And I think this is great. Sean Davari in MLW, great addition to their lineup. And man, this match looked awesome. I think so too. Uh, uh, a great addition, and then uh, watching Davari in the ring, he's quite good. He's got a, he's got a what I refer to now as a retro style kind of thing. He he uh, he doesn't hurry. He's not he's not moving a million miles an hour. He's not doing a million different moves and trying to get all his shit in all the time. He the first five minutes of this match were nice. He took Zenshi down in some wrestling maneuvers. He worked on the arm for the first five minutes or so. Uh, they had a nice little wrestling match there with some uh, some good strikes, some good holds and everything. What did you think of the right towards the very end of the match? Munson Zenshi hit that nice move. Uh, we were talking earlier about uh, Leo Rush and, and how he had uh, kind of uh, tweaked his offense to work more for the guy of the smaller stature or whatever. And since he had that move where he did a 450 splash, but from the bottom rope. Yeah. Just, yeah. It was yeah. fucking wild. Wow. Yeah. That's some athleticism right there. It's got hard enough to get those rotations in from the top rope. This guy's doing it off the bottom rope. Yeah. That was really quite impressive. And I remember making in my notes when Zenshi, we first saw him over in MLW was when he took on Kelvin Tankman a few weeks back. And I'm thinking, poor yeah. Zenshi at this time. And then he gives us this match with Davari, which I found thoroughly entertaining. And like you were saying about Davari grounding Zenshi and using those holds, a great way of doing things. Because Zenshi, the smaller guy, the high flyer, known for his lucha work, and stuff like that. Uh, so again, Davari using that kind of mentality and that technique to keep Zenshi ground it was fantastic. And then when Zenshi got to release and do a move like that, he didn't need to do fifty of them in a thirty-minute match on television for free. He did it once. He made it count. It looked fucking great. And we ended up with a great match and a great win in the end for Davari as well too. For sure, I, I like the way you worked that much. And I think that match was just set out nicely too. That. Yeah, not everybody has to do all their shit in each match, you know, 100 miles an hour. And this this was a good match to put Davari over because he had a pretty decent uh, skilled opponent. And he had to use a strategy in order to not get caught by this high flyers offense and stuff. It worked. He grounded him with holds and stuff like that. And still, Zenshi got... A couple of his moves off, one of them being that bottom rope 450 splash. And look, he caught the attention of the of the old time wrestling fans here, Munson and Papa Smokes. Like with that one move, like I'm kind of a fan of Zenshi. Now that was really cool and it looked awesome. And it got him over a little bit, even in that losing effort. Yeah, and I know, again, many people could probably listen to this right now and they could turn around, oh, well, this guy and this guy and this guy do this in Japan on a weekly basis and they do it 17 times a matchup. And I, I get it. There's guys that are very athletic who do these kind of things, but it's more, you got to understand the psychology behind it because, again, I'm not knocking Japan wrestling, don't, Let's not go down that fucking rabbit hole right now either. I do watch 
I do watch some New Japan Pro Wrestling and do enjoy a lot of it as well, too. So we're not going down that rabbit hole, anybody listening. Uh, what I'm trying to make a point at is when you get these matches that do that kind of a move that Zenshi did with the 450 splash, but then it's followed up by another move that's athletic and another athletic high-flying move where it happens over and over again to the point where it feels choreographed instead of feeling like a matchup between two guys who want to win. That's my problem with it. When it gets overdone, it gets annoying, it gets frustrating, and it loses its aura. When Zenshi did it here, it made sense. I loved it. I popped for it. Well done, Zenshi. You made a fan out of me on that one for sure. Yeah, and exactly. And Zenshi, look what you did. You did your job. You did the thing you were supposed to do. You're supposed to get help get the new guy over. You did that, but you also put yourself over just a little bit, just enough to uh, to make some people notice you in a losing effort. It's 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 a win win situation all around. And again, I, I love the booking that goes on in NLW and. Uh, I'm not sure if they have an agent for their matches. I'm sure somebody helps them go over finishes and stuff, but whoever's doing that is doing a real good job too. And uh, hats off again to MLW, putting out some uh, quality product that makes sense to the viewer. Yeah, definitely. And now uh, next up, we had a promo from uh, Myron Reed. Now he's uh, going back on the promos on Injustice. And again, every single week that Myron Reed talks right now, Papa Smokes, I'm Liking more and more of what he's saying. I'm a little bit each week, it just a little bit more. I'm I'm into it. I'm interested. Again, I think he's in over his fucking head right now, but I do think that the promos help to build it at the same time. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that too. Um, when I first started watching Injustice uh, two years ago or something, I I wasn't sure about the guys. Uh, I I. Uh, I didn't take to them completely. I kind of thought there might be something in Jordan Oliver at some point, but the other guys never caught with me. But since the since the restart, uh, I think you and I both both noticed that uh, Myron Reed in particular has stepped up his game quite a lot, promos and in ring style. I think Jordan Oliver is uh, trying to join in on that too, and and by the look of it, Injustice is getting a. You know what could be kind of a main event run against uh, members of Contra. Uh, if you you get the spot against Contra, you're you're pretty much made for some big matches there too. So uh, obviously, Court and MLW have some faith in Injustice, and uh, as we saw with Myron Reed versus Leo Rush, capable of putting on some really high quality matches. So uh, yeah, give the boys more. Give them something they they can. Uh, they can sink their teeth into with a nice feud against Contra. They've got a bunch of good guys uh, that can be used in the villain category against them. And uh, I'm looking forward to this feud uh, uh, just a little bit tentatively. I, like I say, I think they might be in over their head, but uh, you know, you never know what can happen in the wacky world of professional wrestling. Exactly, man. Uh, so next up from there, we went over to Savio Vega making a challenge to Richard Holiday. So now Savio Vega wants to challenge Richard Holiday to a Caribbean strap match for the Caribbean Championship on MLW. He's having all the all the details figured out, put into a contract and having it faxed over to Richard Holiday's lawyer slash father to make sure that this match gets signed up. Uh, he also said that this strap they're going to use in this Caribbean strap match is the exact same one that he had with his strap match with uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin back in the WWE with. And I know somebody posed this question to Court Bauer at one point saying, is this for real? Is this the actual strap from that matchup? And Court Bauer himself said, yes, it is. This is actually the same strap they used in that match. Savio Vega has possession of that exact strap, and that was what they were going to use in this Caribbean Championship match. Well, and if you're Savio and... and you had a series of matches against uh, the most biggest, the biggest and most popular wrestler of all time, Stone Cold Steve Austin. You're, you're probably going to keep that strap. Like, I mean, would you throw it out? Definitely not. Like that's a wrestling artifact now, and uh, especially for uh, Savio in his career. So, kind of an interesting little footnote there. They're going to use that same strap that was in the uh, classic matches in. Uh, well, I don't, shouldn't say classic matches, but matches in WWE against their biggest star ever. So, 
wow, that, that strap has uh, seen some miles on, under it and uh, probably a little bit of blood too. Yeah, and might get to see some more. We'd uh, have to wait a little bit longer to find out if uh, Holiday accepts, but we'll get to that here shortly. Uh, from there, we're following up with the next match of the night. We got it finally, Simon Gotch versus Jordan Oliver of Injustice. This match finally happened, even though at Kings of Coliseum it didn't go down due to Gotch being a no-show, and then later going on the attack of both Myron Reed and Jordan Oliver. So finally the grudge match goes down. Here it is. What did you think of this one, Papa Smokes, between these two? Okay, well, first of all, Munson, I wanted to bring up, uh, you just said an interesting point about... Uh, the fact that uh, Simon Gotch and no show at the last match. Uh, is it just me or does, did you think Simon Gotch just, it doesn't really look well these days. He didn't, he looks like there's something wrong with him. I'm not trying to take a shot at Simon Gotch here. I respect him as a wrestler and such. I just mean in the ways of general health, man, I didn't think he looked too good. His, his body looks kind of funny. His, his face looks Pale and such. Well, anyway, I, I, I after I watched this match, I was kind of thinking maybe he was, maybe he was on a week long party bender with Brian Pillman from last time. He wasn't looking so great in his match in the last episode. Maybe these guys are having uh, too many beers together or something. Anyway, uh, uh, Gotch, I, I like him in the ring. He's a tactician. You, you, t you take that last name Gotch uh, and be a wrestler. You better be good at it. And um, yeah. Uh, he, Gotch, controlled this match early with the roughhouse style that he likes to use. Um, looking stiff in the ring, I thought um, a lot of those, a lot of those moves and a lot of those strikes looked like they had some mustard behind them. Um, I don't know if that's just uh, uh, good pro wrestling or if he's uh, if he's laying it to Jordan a little bit. I'm not too sure, but uh, Gotch eventually catching Oliver in. Uh, in a chokehold sleeper kind of hold and uh, wins the bout and then works over uh, Jordan Oliver a little bit after the bell, just showing that there's a feud going on here. It's not just a, it's not just a one-off match. It's a grudge match and uh, they're leading towards a, a feud of their respective factions. So uh has the bad blood after the bell and already some, uh, some mean words have been said and then, uh, yeah, Jordan Oliver taking a loss, getting choked out, and then getting stomped out after the match. So uh, Contra making a pretty firm statement here. And can we say credit to the sell on the chokehold from uh, Jordan Oliver? I mean, uh, the match yeah. was was decent, and I see where you're going with Simon Gotch as well, too. I mean, he's a great tactician and everything like that. But, yeah, he, he looked off. For some reason, and I don't know what it was. Yeah. It, the first thing that went to my head, honestly, Papa Smokes, was could this guy have been in isolation? Did he have COVID? And that was part of the yeah. protocol. Like, was he sent home because he tested positive? And then that's why this match had to get delayed by another few weeks or more kind of thing to make sure that he was safe to go back. Because as we reported uh, way back on an earlier edition of Ring Respect, was that MLW were taking the COVID-19 protocols very seriously and that they actually have hired a COVID-19 officer to assure that they don't have any issues with COVID-19 virus there at MLW. Yeah, perhaps that is what happened, and they're just uh, not saying it outright like that. Who knows, but um, I guess time will tell. But uh, Gotch is still with a pretty prominent position in Contra, so uh, he'll be there uh, fighting along his side. Yeah, and definitely, and he goes over Jordan Oliver, again, making uh, Contra look strong and making it look like Injustice definitely in over their heads. What have they gotten themselves into? It's just the two of them. I mean, you see seen Simon Gotch choking out Jordan Oliver like this. I mean, what's uh, what's next for these boys? Again, at least it leaves us to question it and go, what are we going to see? I I'm excited for it, but, uh, you know, we'll find out more as time goes on here. So Then uh, from there, we got a uh, Team Filthy promo after this one, uh, Bob Smokes. Again, uh, let it t tell the fans what you thought of Team Filthy talking on this one. Yeah, uh I think Team Filthy are pretty strong on promos. I think Lawler is good. He's funny, and uh, he has uh, he enunciates everything nicely. Cuts a good promo. Um, I like uh, what they're doing with uh, the other guys in Team Filthy right now. Uh, Dominic Garini and the other dudes. Uh, they're they're just just seeming like a very uh, easy to hate faction, and uh, 
giving it to Alicia too, and, and her not liking that. Uh, Team Filthy healing it up, and uh, I'm looking forward to more from uh, Island in the near future too. Uh, I think these guys are gold on this show, and uh, I want to see more. Yeah, and you know, credit to this too. Tom Waller got in there, and he introduced us more to uh, Kevin Gabrini or Kevin Garini and uh, or sorry, Kevin Koo and. Gabrini. Dominic Gabrini. Dominic Gabrini. Yeah. There we go. Sorry. Uh, so he introduced us more to them. He told us a little bit more about their backgrounds, why we should, you know, why guys should be afraid of these two guys when it comes to the squared circle and everything like that. So without going into too much detail, he let us know these guys have a great fighting background. They're, you know, trained fighters. These guys are ready to kill inside that ring. And I mean, again, it makes you go, shit, this is a team to be reckoned with when it comes to that squared circle. Yeah, we've, we've talked on previous episodes about shooters in the ring before, and, and Garini and Koo and Lawler are obviously uh, all shooters. Uh, and, uh, I mean, that kind of a team or that kind of a wrestler always carries that little bit of extra oomph because whatever you want to think about the, you know, about the, the wrestling that's predetermined or choreographed or anything like that, the, when, when wrestlers are shooters – part of that goes out the window because you think, well, if, if anything ever went wrong, like this guy could probably beat up most of the dudes in his federation and all that. So it, it gives you that little extra, uh, push over. I think when, when you already have the, uh, martial arts skill or wrestling skill outside of professional wrestling, and then you can bring that, that those talents into the ring and add them to your repertoire in uh, pro wrestling. Yeah, and it just, so a great job here done, but then immediately this was cut off because we get uh, uh, breaking news, I guess, Alicia to confirming that ACH named Garini as one of the attackers in the assault, said that he heard the voice of Garini during the assault, and ACH now pointing fingers directly at the members of Team Filthy for his earlier assault. Yeah, yeah, well... Um... I could certainly see Team Filthy doing something like that. I don't know why they would beat up ACH before his match against Contra, against uh, Jacob Fatu. Not sure why they would want to protect Fatu from ACH, but uh, perhaps it's something, uh, a little subtlety that we don't know about yet uh, between these between these teams. Yeah, I think there's a lot being fleshed out, and the more you start seeing these episodes kind of come together and fleshing out some of the stuff, a lot more of what they've set up in the past is making sense, so it makes me believe, again, here, there's more to the story coming up, and we're going to get to that eventually, hopefully, and again, it's these little teases that make you believe they've got ideas for down the road and everything like that, they've got a lot of plans in place, which excites me as a fan, it makes me want to keep tuning in, because if these guys have a long-term plan for a lot of these guys, then I'm going to be more engaged as a fan in the long term as well, too. And booking it as the slow burn, too, is nice. Instead of in wrestling these days, there's so much hot shot booking that just does everything immediately and, 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 and you know, blows its wad way too early, so to speak, by giving the big matches uh, without so much build-up and all that. And then... What are you supposed to do after that? And it just doesn't make sense to do it like that. But MLW, yeah, they're they're doing the slow build up on some of these, and I appreciate that. It's it's uh, sometimes I don't even want to think about what they're getting to because I rather than work it out in my head the possibilities, I'd rather just watch it unfold on the TV. And sometimes, as a you know, a wrestling historian, and, and as uh, as as people that work in the business like you and I, Munson, it, it can affect your viewing of wrestling if, if you really dissect it and think about it all the time. But some of these angles in MLW, I, I just don't even want to think about because I know it'll be more fun as it unfolds in front of me. So I'm, I'm trying to do that too and, and just enjoy it as it goes along. Yeah, and I mean, you say about like working in the business, one of the hardest things has been – uh, since starting to do anything in the business, whether it be the commentary, the editing, the you know work we do with the boys uh, at the shows and stuff like that, I mean, one of the hardest things is to sit down as a fan and be engaged, especially if there's not enough there to engage me anymore, because you start to you start to learn a little bit more about the business, and so it kind of 
it beats that little bit of that fan fanboy you know wrestling fan out of you a little bit and eventually you gotta find reasons to continue to really enjoy it and a well booked thought out wrestling show with good matches featuring characters i can get behind is enough to keep me engaged i don't care what involvement i have i'm always going to be a fan of things that are put together like that yeah yeah good point uh, uh... Uh, there, there is. It brings to mind a, an old poem by the poet Wordsworth too. He has a line that says, uh, "We murder to dissect," and, and that, that's exactly what this is. Sometimes, is you want to figure out what something's all about. You have to dissect it to see all the parts inside and how they work. But unfortunately, you dissect something, you also kill it and you destroy its beauty too. So, I mean, I think I still lie somewhere in between those two things a little bit, but. Uh, um, yeah, it's just all, all the more tip of the hat to MLW for keeping me engaged as a fan. And, uh, yeah, I just, I, I try not to think, we do these reviews and such, but I, I try not to think ahead too much because I just, I like the way this unfolds. I like the way they present their surprises. And, uh, yeah, I'm just having fun as a fan watching this as well. Yeah, and I've been really enjoying doing these uh, recaps and reviews as well, too, because it gives us a lot of new content to talk about as well here on the show and shows that uh, we're not always just about the retro all the time. We do enjoy some new stuff as long as it's put together in a sensible manner. And, you know, mad props MLW for keeping a couple of guys like us fans even in this modern era. Yeah, yeah. As we talked about all through, uh, you know, this past year's shutdown and everything, we everybody was dying for some new content and there were a, a couple of companies, of course, that continued taping, whether there was a pandemic or not, but uh, just not really my cup of tea for, for viewing uh, pleasures, though uh, I was just so glad when a few of the smaller companies finally did come back and we could watch some new stuff week to week and, uh, you know, get some fresh content uh, along with the, uh, the large catalog of retro wrestling that I, that I regularly watch anyway. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's been nice. So uh, carrying on with the review, um, next up, we finally got our answer to the challenge laid by Savio Vega. The strap match is confirmed. Richard Holiday, uh, his uh, father slash lawyer, got the paperwork. It's all been signed. It's been accepted. And we're going to get the match, Papa Smokes, a Caribbean strap match for the Caribbean Championship next week, episode 119 of MLW Fusion. It's going to be Savio Vega, Richard Holiday, and the winner will be the official and undisputed, I believe it's IWA champion, uh, Caribbean champion. Okay, interesting. This is going to be a great match. Uh, uh, I think this is another one of those moments that Richard Holiday needs to cement himself as, as kind of a middle to upper card guy in uh, MLW. Um, we've questioned him before and just thought that he's got all the parts there, but he needs... He needs a couple of moments. He needs a couple of big matches. He needs a couple of big moves or moments during matches, and uh, I think he'll he'll be over more than he is now. And and maybe this is what he needs. Uh, Savio Vega is a, a fairly respected uh, star from uh, from the past in some other big feds, and uh, also known as a trainer and an agent as well. So this guy understands the business all the way through he'll he will have a vested interest in making sure this match is agented properly laid out properly and then executed properly so i bet you this will be a pretty good match uh, uh, i like the occasional gimmick match uh, there's a lot of gimmick matches that go on in the business nowadays uh, some entire pay-per-views are all gimmick matches now which i think is just vastly overdoing it but I'm looking forward to this one, a strap match. Uh, might see some good violence, and uh, Richard Holiday maybe not used to uh, brawl like that either. That could be a good one. I think in a sense, too, it also, in some ways, and I, I, I don't want to say this and make it sound wrong, but it kind of protects Savio Vega in a way, making this a Caribbean strap match. I mean, if we're going for a straight one-on-one -on -one wrestling match, I mean, Savio Vega has had his better days behind him as far as uh, a good classic wrestling match would go. And probably wouldn't like live up to the hype that you would get with Richard Holiday in that ring. I think a better fit for them, especially being it's the Caribbean Championship, makes sense to have a Caribbean strap match. And I think will allow them 
to do that type of matchup well without ever making it, uh, you know, look like this is a younger guy taking on somebody who's been around quite a while. Yeah, yeah, and and as Vegas said in his promo too, he he cut a pretty nice one too and said uh, this isn't just about the title and it's not just about the pride of winning the match and everything, but he's he's got a national pride for his country and his people and his area and he doesn't like what uh, Holiday, the rich American jerk, came down and disrespected the people of the Caribbean and uh, Puerto Rico and such and stole the belt from there he doesn't like that he, it's, it's a matter of pride for him therefore that the strap match kind of makes sense because he wants to not only beat uh, holiday but he wants to punish him in a way right and, and hurt him and, and humiliate him and maybe send him away with some blood on his face so he never comes back and uh, i just think they're doing a good job of promoting this match and uh, looking forward to seeing him yeah and the nice thing is too is they're starting to use some uh, interpromotional championships uh, in MLW. So that's one thing I enjoy seeing. It, it not only reminds me uh, when I look back on the territory days that we talk about here on the show and see that that was something that was used back then, bringing in champions from all over and featuring them on different shows. But it reminds me of watching boxing as a kid. I grew up being a big fan of boxing. I uh, got taught how to be a boxer for a little while as well, too. And I got to see all these guys coming in, and they'd have, your champions had three or four different championship belts. There was the main belt for their weight class that was promoted within North America, but they would have belts that they had won from all over the globe and stuff like that as well, too. And so it was nice to see the MOW moving forward with some of this interpromotional championships and really give it a lot of jazz. I mean, I know we've harped a little bit on t uh, t t companies using too many championships and stuff like that, but I think... When it's an interpromotional championship, there's a large difference in that versus having, say, nine different belts on your from your same company. Yeah, very much so. And uh, just like we were talking about before, just, just it, it adds an international flavor to the show. It, it's not just it's not just an American company being taped in a city, and they have most of their shows in that city. But it, that's fine, but I like it when there's, uh, you know, you sometimes get the, the Mads Kruger from Germany and you get Akiro Kwan from Japan and you get uh, Kevin Koo from South America and, and, and uh, uh, the Caribbean title making an appearance in here too. And it, it's just interesting because sometimes you don't know some of these uh, wrestlers from other countries and, and it's just a, it's a joy to see them and, and uh Maybe you're not going to like everyone, but at least you get exposed to some different uh, uh, nationalities of people. And, and, of course, wrestlers from different countries uh, have been trained in different styles. And there's there's little uh, nuances and little bits and uh, pieces of their offense and defense that will be different than the American or Canadian style as well. And, and that's what we all like to see, the little differences that make everybody interesting and uh yeah, I, as I understand it, Court Bauer is trying to get something going with uh, some promotions in Africa somewhere, which I have never really heard about before. I, I, I don't know if they have uh, uh, many cities with uh, thriving professional wrestling scene there. I'm going to guess that South Africa probably has something going on. I would guess that maybe uh, some of the northern African countries to do also, such as Egypt and all that, but... Uh, I really don't know, but again, I'm excited to see if if he if Court can make a deal with uh, what uh, some wrestlers have going on in, in other countries. It's, it's just fascinating to think of the uh, characters they might have and the skills they might have and the stories they might be able to tell if they came over here. Well, and once uh, international travel starts to become more of a thing again uh, in the future, I mean, it, it opens up all these. I you know I want to say territories, and in a sense, they are. I mean. These are territories where wrestling might not be very well known or vibrant at the moment, but if you can get eyes watching over from here over to there, and then you're sending some of these guys down that way and stuff like that, you're only going to make bigger stars out of the talent pool you already have. Yeah, yeah, uh, I, I think so too, and uh, the fans end up winning as well because, like I said, we get we get uh, runs or shots made by. Uh, uh, wrestlers from different countries that we're not familiar with. 
we all get to see something different, whether it's uh, on a short-term basis or a longer-term basis. You just get this in, influx of fresh talent all the time, and, and that's what you want from your show. Uh, there, we have enough uh, big feds on TV right now that just have use their same roster and the same guys all the time and uh, the same matchups. How many times can you put the same 25 guys against each other without it looking uh, stale? And uh, yeah, it does end up looking stale. But if you're if you're trading with trading talent with promotions from other countries and other areas of the world, it, uh, I just think the fans come out the winners. Yeah, they definitely do, and we get treated to such great matchups. Uh, again, another one that they're working with being AAA. We've mentioned a lot of times, and their AAA uh, cruiserweight champion, the Laredo Kid. I mean, has been fantastic and constantly in that top ten of the PWI top 10 on MLW each week. So it's a lot of that international flavor that we continue to get. And I mean, this matchup we're going to get between holiday and Savio Vega only highlights how great that is and how well MLW's handled it all. Yeah. Great stuff. And, uh, and, uh, the company looking good. We got uh, a number of angles going with a number of different, uh, wrestlers in the, in the promotion. And, uh, we, we have to remember, too, that it was also announced uh, during this time here, uh, Alicia, too, announced that Promociones Dorado, which is uh, Selena De La Renta's promotions company, had been acquired by Azteca Underground Incorporated. Now, this I'm not sure what this is going to mean in a business sense in future episodes here, but I have the feeling... Um, this is going to be significant, too, because as it was announced to Selena, she looked very surprised and uh, was trying to keep her composure on camera. Not sure what her emotion was, but it, it uh, shocked her anyway that uh, her promotions company had been taken over by Azteca Underground. Now, I'm not sure what that is either. I have a feeling they might have uh, an affiliation with AAA in Mexico, but... Um, She's she's maybe just lost a little uh, pawn in her uh, in her war there with uh, her her promotions company getting acquired by a, a different parent company. We'll have to see where this leads in the future too. I have the feeling this could be big news uh, eventually. Oh, for sure. And I mean, you're you're hitting all sorts of thoughts here with me, Papa Smokes, because I have watched ahead on the episodes and everything like that. But I'm going to shut my mouth now because I'm going to. Start dropping too much information. So we're going to move right on to the main event of MLW Fusion, number 118. This is the championship match that's been talked about. MLW heavyweight champion Jacob Fatu defending against ACH. ACH coming out. His ribs are taped up. He's selling the hell out of this beatdown that he's taken that he's pointing the finger at uh, Team Filthy for. And he's going to go out there and fight this match regardless. And what a treat we're in for. Uh, what do you think of this match, Pop Smokes? Well, Fatu entered the ring with Davari as his second. He usually has uh, Joseph Samael, but we haven't seen him since the restart. He, uh, we have seen him, but only on video, not in person for the tapings. So uh, he's staying home for now. But uh, Davari in the corner of Fatu. Um, they told us that this is the first MLW world title shot for ACH. So that's interesting, too, because he's been... Uh, Pretty much a top guy in this company the whole time, but uh, uh, yeah, first title shot for him. Too bad he's uh, injured for it. Kind of, uh, kind of speaks to his uh, chances for success might be uh, negatively impacted by that. We had Fatu starting the match with vicious strikes as usual. Um, the guy can just make it look so good. But doesn't he just look like a street ganger or like some street brawling tough guy? Isn't Fatu just excellent at that brawling style? Muscle? Oh, he's got that brawling nailed down. And then he's, at the same time, he also brings in that flavor that's, uh, you know, very notorious for the Samoan wrestlers and stuff like that. He very much reminds me of a more brawling version of Umaga in so many ways. Yeah, I was going to say, of all those guys, he kind of reminds me of Umaga the most, uh, not, not quite as big as Umaga, but uh, uh, same thing, uh, uh, just tough and vicious and, and head butts and biting and striking and then those barefoot kicks all the time. Uh, just an awesome offense. Uh, 
you just wouldn't want to have a match against this guy. No, he's he's everything that I've always enjoyed about the Samoan uh, bloodline that's ever wrestled and stuff like that. I've always been a fan of pretty much everybody that's come out of their family. Uh, it, it's like it, it's it's genetically built into them, Paul Smokes. These guys are all built to look like stars. They wrestle like stars, and they handle their business like stars. It's fantastic. Jacob fought too. Fantastic. And going up here against ACH, who I've been a fan of ACH for quite some time, Papa Smokes. I, I really enjoyed watching this guy over in uh, Ring of Honor and stuff like that and thought there was a lot to him, a lot to his game. And since this restart, man, I'm enjoying ACH even more. And this match, no exception. I loved this matchup. Yeah, um, I, I didn't know who ACH was a few years ago, but I saw him live in Saskatoon. He uh, did a show for one of the uh, uh, traveling companies that came through Saskatoon. And uh, yeah, trust me, in, in person, it's quite impressive. He, he looks bigger in person, too, and uh, has a little bit of a strength style as well, but just uh, good grappling and, and, and also uh, light on his feet with some aerial stuff as well. And, Pretty well-balanced attack. I was impressed with him the first time I saw him. And uh, like I say, he remains kind of a middle-to-upper card guy in MLW. And uh, him getting a title shot, really no surprise. Uh, he'll be one of the guys that uh, will get his time with Fatu. But as we saw in this match, just he couldn't really get a lot of his offense off with the rib injuries or midsection injuries that he had. Uh, he was trying to pick up the much heavier Fatu in a kind of a fireman's carry type thing, and, and that wasn't going well. Couldn't get him uh, off his feet and, and trying some other strength-based moves that he, his body just wasn't able to complete on this night. And uh, you don't have to make too many mistakes to have uh, Jacob Fatu make that go real badly for you. And uh, we saw that, exactly that happen. Yeah, I mean, and ACH, I mean, it's this this look this was a good look for him. He gets the championship matchup. Again, bill, billing him, I would say, as a upper mid card guy, a guy that can mix it up with guys like Jacob Fatu and everything like that. Uh not the guy that they're gonna pull the trigger on and make a champion just yet, at least not their main champion anyway. But a guy that they can rely on, you're gonna get a quality match out of him. He's someone you can stick in there with your champion, and both guys come out looking like gold afterward. I mean, obviously Jacob Fatu continues to look like an absolute dominant monster with that championship. ACH not looking like a chump at the end of the night. I mean, he gave it his all despite having the earlier beatdown, despite having his ribs taped up and everything like that. He really got that hero's pop that he needed coming out there and showing that he's ready to kick some ass, doesn't matter what condition he's in. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, ACH, when we talk about his place on the card, I mean, this could be a guy... Uh, I could see him maybe as a future world heavyweight champion at some point, but I could see him as the open weight champion if uh, if and when Alexander Hammerstone uh, uh, loses or is done with that belt. I could see ACH having a successful run with that title as well. Oh, for sure, man. And that's exactly what I was thinking along those lines, especially for, you know, like the immediate future, like the near future. I could see ACH definitely being in that title picture. Uh, sooner rather than later and really carrying that uh, that championship I mean it's going to be hard to fill the boots of Alexander Hammerstone when that belt finally drops from him but at the same time ACH is the kind of guy who could carry it and keep the interest in that division as well too well that's good that I'm sure he'll get lots of work in MLW he's one of the more popular wrestlers there I can see why and uh, coming up short tonight but as you said, not looking any weaker for it. Um, it wasn't his night. He got jumped earlier in the week. He had an injury. It, it uh, didn't allow him to perform a whole bunch of his usual offense, which he maybe could have. Uh, he maybe could have uh, taken down uh, uh, Jacob Fatu a little bit in this match with some good offense, but uh, yeah, just not able to do it. Wasn't his night. Lost the match by pinfall with the. Uh, springboard to moonsault from Fatu. There's nobody getting up from that move at this time. So, uh, yeah, a good match, but uh, ultimately coming up short. Still looks okay, though. Still looks like uh, 
baby face towards the top of the cart that uh, is going to have a, a good program with someone in the near future. And uh, I would predict an open weight title run. Yeah, for sure, man. And just as we thought this night was over, Jacob fought too, celebrating at the top of the ramp with the other members of Contra. And lo and behold, we got a little bit of a surprise at the end of the night. And Justice got one up over Contra. I mean, we talked about it. What are these guys in over their head? And they dressed up like members of the Sentai Death Squad, popped out. And it turns out it's the Injustice. They got one over on Contra, despite being the totally undersized team in in the two. Yeah, yeah. What well, uh, that uh, popped me for sure when the, you always see the, uh, the Contra's uh, minions there, the masked uh, Death Squad with the flags, and they they. Uh, they uh, present the flags as their as Contra enters the ring, and then sometimes covering the victims with the flags afterwards. But uh, as Contra left the ring, yeah, the Sentai Death Squad now lay in the flag poles across their backs, and uh, now it's a it's a jumping situation. And yeah, wouldn't you know it? It's injustice under those masks. And, you know, me as we said, they look like they're a little bit overmatched in this feud, but that's why. Perhaps that they decide to use uh, uh, clandestine tactics like that, uh, hiding in plain sight, uh, doing the doing the beat down on the on the stronger faction, but with the element of surprise. And maybe they're onto something there. Maybe they're not in uh, over their heads like I thought they were. This was a nicely done segment. Yeah, I agree too. I mean, again, we sat there and it's it's been all talk from them and no action. And we saw earlier in the night with Jordan Oliver getting choked out, and you're. You to believe basically injustice has got no chance at all, and then when they pull this off, it's like, well, okay, if they use uh, smart tactics and stuff like that, I can I can buy them doing stuff like that. I mean, they got their hits in, they ran off, they had their laughs. I mean, they really got under the skin of Contra, which not a lot of teams or anybody in particular has been able to do as of late. Yeah, yeah, we have to wonder what the consequences will be for injustice in the near future too. Will they be able to stay that half step ahead of Contra, or have they just doomed themselves to a punishment uh, that might be uh, really, really terrible for them? Uh, we'll have to see, but uh, they've got some street smarts there in Justice, and uh, they've been uh, around the block a few times, as it were, and uh, really perpetuated this sneak attack quite nicely, and uh, it's, it's setting up a little mini feud here quite nicely. Yeah, they say payback's a bitch, so Injustice, you better be watching out because I'm sure there's going to be repercussions. And we're going to begin to those repercussions soon enough right here on Ring Respect Radio. Uh, we will get to reviewing more MLW Fusion as well as anything else that you have in store for us. If you're listening to the show right now and you know of a professional wrestling show that you're really into that is not one of the big guys on TV, something that may be available on YouTube and leads a little bit more attention and might just happen to be something you think Papa Smokes and I would enjoy, drop us a line down below in the comment section. Hey, we want to hear from you. Let us talk wrestling. Let us know what your guys' thoughts are. What do you think of MLW? What do you think of our show so far? And also, what wrestling are you into? Papa Smokes and I want to discover more, want to learn more, and have more to talk about right here on the show. Uh, this includes independent companies, you guys. We've done a lot of reviews for uh, the Alberta companies and stuff like that, as well as uh, reviewing some of the stuff that goes on locally here in Saskatchewan as well, too. You got something for us, tag us in it, send us a message down below in those comments section. We want to hear from you. Uh, before we wrap this up, Papa Smokes, any last things to add to the night? No, no, but I like your idea. To any of you fans and listeners out there, you got some you got some wrestling for it? We'll send along, we'll watch it. That's what we do is watch wrestling. That's right. So send it our way. We're happy to hear from you all. And thank you once again for tuning in to another edition of Ring Respect Radio right here on the Video Bros Network. We look forward to seeing you all again next time. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.